Book Twelve, Part Two of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Wolfe. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso, translated by Brooks Moore. Book Twelve, Part Two. The daughter of Elatus, Cenus, was remarkable for charm most beautiful of all Thessalian maidens. Many sighed for her in vain through all the neighbouring towns, and yours, Achilles, for that was our home. But Peleus did not try to win her love, for he was either married at that time to your dear mother, or was pledged to her. Cenus never became the willing bride of any suitor, but report declares, while she was walking on a lonely shore, the god of ocean saw and ravished her. And in the joy of that love, Neptune said, Request of me whatever you desire, and nothing shall deny your dearest wish. The story tells us that he made this pledge, and Cenus said to Neptune, The great wrong which I have suffered from you justifies the wonderful request that I must make. I ask that I may never suffer such an injury again. Grant I may be no longer woman, and I'll ask no more. While she was speaking to him, the last words of her strange prayer were uttered in so deep, in such a manly tone, it seemed indeed they must be from a man. That was a fact. Neptune not only had allowed her prayer, but made the new man proof against all wounds of spear or sword. Rejoicing in the gift, he went his way as keen as Atrocities, spent years in every manful exercise, and roamed the plains of northern Thessaly. The son of bold Ixion, Pirithus wedding Hippodame, had asked us guests the cloud-born centaurs to recline around the ordered tables in a cool cave set under some shading trees. Thessalian chiefs were there, and I myself was with them there. The festal place resounded with the rout and noisy clamour, singing nuptial verse, and in the great room, filled with smoking fire, the maiden came escorted by a crowd of matrons and young married women, she most beautiful of all that lovely throng. And so Pirithus, the fortunate son of bold Ixion, was so praised by all, for his pure joy and lovely wife, it seemed his very blessings must have led to fatal harm, for savage Eurytus, wildest of the wild centaurs, now inflamed with sudden envy, drunkenness, and lust, upset the tables and made havoc there so dreadful that the banquet suddenly was changed from love to uproar. Seized by the hair, the bride was violently dragged away, when Eurytus caught up Hippodame, each one of all the centaurs took at will the maid or matron that he longed for most. The palace, seeming like a captured town, resounded with affrighted shrieks of women. At once we all sprang up, and Theseus cried, What madness, Eurytus, has driven you to this vile wickedness? While I have life, you dare attack Pirithus. You know not what you do, for one wrong injures both. The valiant hero did not merely talk. He pushed them off as they were pressing on, and rescued her whom Eurytus had seized. Since Eurytus could not defend such deeds with words, he turned and beat with violent hands the face of him who saved the bride and struck his generous breast. By chance an ancient bowl was near at hand. This rough with figures carved, the son of Aegeus caught, and hurled it full in that vile centaur's face. He, spouting out thick gouts of blood, and bleeding from his wounds, his brains and wine mixed, kicked the blood-soaked sand. His double-membered centaur brothers, wild with passion at his death, all shouted out, To arms! To arms! Their courage raised by wine. In their first onset, hurled cups flew about, and shattered wine-casks, hollow basins, things before adapted to a banquet, now for death and carnage in the furious fight. Amicus first, Opinion's son, began to spoil the inner sanctuary of its gifts. He snatched up from that shrine a chandelier adorned with glittering lamps, and lifted high with all the force of one who strives to break the bull's white neck with sacrificial axe, he dashed it at the head of Celadon, one of the Lepithi, and crushed his skull into the features of his face. His eyes leapt from his sockets, and the shattered bones of his smashed face gave way so that his nose was driven back and fastened in his throat. But Bellatus of Pella tore away a table-leg of maple-wood, and felled Amicus to the ground, his sunken chin cast down upon his breast, 
and as he spat his teeth out mixed with blood, a second blow dispatched him to the shades of Tartarus. Grineus, seeing a smoking altar, cried, Good use for this, with which words he raised up that heavy blazing altar. Hurling it into the middle of the Lepithai, he struck down Broteas and Orias. Makale, mother of that Orias, was famous for her incantations, which she had often used to conjure down the shining twin horns of the unwilling moon. Exadius threatened, You shall not escape, let me but have a weapon. And with that he whirled the antlers of a votive stag, which he found there, hung on a tall pine tree, and with that double-branching horn he pierced the eyes of Grinius, and he gouged them out. One eye stuck to the horn, the other rolled down on his beard, to which it strictly clung in dreadful clotted gore. Then Rhetus snatched a blazing brand of plumwood from an altar, and whirling it upon the right, smashed through the temples of Caraxus, wonderful with golden hair. Seized by the violent flames, his yellow locks burned fiercely as a field of autumn grain, and even the scorching blood gave from the sore wound a terrific noise as a red-hot iron and pincers which the smith lifts out and plunges in the tepid pool, hissing and sizzling. Caraxus shook the fire from his burnt locks, and heaved up on his shoulders a large threshold stone torn from the ground, a weight sufficient for a team of oxen. The vast weight impeded him, so that it could not even touch his foe, and yet the massive stone did hit his friend Cometes, who was standing near to him, and crushed him down. Then Rhetus, crazed with joy, exulting, yelled, I pray that all of you may be so strong. Wielding his half-burned stake with heavy blows again and again, he broke the sutures of his enemy's skull, until the bones were mingled with his oozing brains. Victorious then rushed he upon Evagrus, and Corythus, and Dryas. First of these was youthful Corythus, whose cheeks were then just covered with soft down. When he fell dead, Evagrus cried, What glory do you get, killing a boy? But Rhetus did not give him time for uttering one word more. He pushed the red-hot stake into the foeman's mouth, while he still spoke, and down into his lungs. He then pursued the savage Dryas, while whirling the red fire fast about his head, but not with like success. For while he still rejoiced in killings, Dryas turned and pierced him with a stake where neck and shoulder meet. Rhetus groaned, and with a great effort pulled the stake out from the bone, then fled away, drenched in his blood. And Orneus followed him. Lacabus fled, and Medon, with a wound in his right shoulder. Thormas and Pisanor and Murmurus fled with them. Murmurus, who used to excel all others in a race, ran slowly, crippled by a recent wound. Pholus and Melanius ran for their lives, and with them Abas, hunter of wild boars, and Asbolus, the augur, who in vain had urged his friends to shun that hapless fight. As Nessus joined the rout, he said to him, You need not flee, for you shall be reserved a victim for the bow of Hercules. But neither Lycidas, Eurynomus, nor Ereus, nor Imbrius had escaped from death. For all of these, the strong right hand of Dryas pierced as they confronted him. Craneus there received a wound in front. Although he turned in flight, as he looked back, a heavy javelin between his eyes pierced through him, where his nose and forehead joined. In all this uproar, Aphidas lay flat, in endless slumber from the wine he drank, incessant, and his nerveless hand still held the cup of mixed wine as he lay full-stretched upon a shaggy bearskin from Mount Ossa. When Forbus saw him, harmless in that sleep, he laid his fingers in his javelin's thong, and shouted loudly, Mix your wine down there with waters of the Styx, and, stopping talk, let fly his javelin at the sleeping youth. The ashen shaft, iron-tipped, was driven through his neck, exposed as he by chance lay there, his head thrown back. He did not even feel a touch of death, and from his deep-pierced throat his crimson blood flowed out upon the couch, and in the wine-bowl still grasped in his hand. I saw Petraeus when he strove to tear up from the earth an acorn-bearing oak, and while he struggled with it back and forth and was just ready to wrench up the trunk, Pirithus hurled a well-aimed spear at him, transfixed his ribs, and pinned his body tight, writhing to that hard oak. And Lycus fell, and Chromus fell, before Pirithus. They gave less glory to the conqueror than Helops or than Dictus. 
Helips was killed by a javelin which pierced his temples from the right side, clear through to his left ear, and Dictus, running in a desperate haste, hoping in vain to escape Ixion's son, slipped on the steep edge of a precipice, and as he fell down headlong crashed into the top of a huge ash-tree which impaled his dying body on its broken spikes. Alphaeus, eager to avenge him, tried to lift a rock from that steep mountainside, but as he heaved, the son of Aegeus struck him squarely with an oaken club, and smashed and broke the huge bones of that centaur's arm. He has no time, and does not want to give that useless foe to death. He leaps upon the back of tall Bionor, never trained to carry riders, and he fixed his knees firm in the centaur's ribs, and holding tight to the long hair seized by his left hand, struck and shattered the hard features and fierce face and bony temples with his club of gnarled strong oak. And with it he struck to the ground Nedimnus, and Lycopes, dart expert, and Hippasus, whose beard hid all his breast, and Rephaeus, taller than the highest trees, and Thereas, who would carry home alive the raging bears, caught in Thessalian hills. Demolean could no longer stand and look on Theseus and his unrestrained success. He struggled with vast effort to tear up an old pine, trunk and all, with its long roots, and failing shortly in that first attempt, he broke it off and hurled it at this foe. But Theseus saw the pine tree in its flight, and warned by Pallas, got beyond its range. His boast was, Pallas had directed him. And yet the missile was not launched in vain. It sheared the left shoulder and the breast from tall Crantor. He, Achilles, was your father's armor-bearer, and was given by King Amentor when he sued for peace. When Peleus, at a distance, saw him torn and mangled, he exclaimed, At least receive this sacrifice, O Crantor, most beloved, dearest of young men. And with sturdy arm and all his strength of soul as well, he hurled his ashen lance against Demoleon, which, piercing through his shivered ribs, hung there and quivered in the bones. The centaur wrenched the wooden shaft out with his frenzied hands, but could not move the pointed head, which stuck within his lungs. His very anguish gave him such a desperation that he rose against his foe and trampled and beat down the hero with his hoofs. Peleus allowed the blows to fall on helm and ringing shield. Protected so, he watched his time and thrust up through the centaur's shoulder. By one stroke he pierced two breasts, where horse and man form met. Before this, Peleus with the spear had killed both Miles and Phlegraeus, and with the sword, Iphinus and Clanus. Now he killed Dorylas, who was clad in a wolf-skin cap and fought with curving bull's horns dripping blood. To him I said, for courage gave me strength, your horns are much inferior to my steel, and through my spear. Since he could not avoid the gleaming point, he held up his right hand to shield his forehead from the threatened wound. His hand was pierced and pinned against his forehead. He shouted madly. Peleus, near him while he stood there pinned and helpless with his wound, struck him with sharp sword in the belly deep. He leapt forth fiercely as he trailed his bowels upon the ground, with his entangled legs treading upon them, bursting them, he fell with empty belly, lifeless to the earth. Calarus. Beauty did not save your life, if beauty is in any of your tribe. Your golden beard was in its early growth, your golden hair came flowing to your shoulders. In your bright face there was a pleasing glance. The neck and shoulders and the hands and breast, and every aspect of his human form resembled those admired statues which our gifted artists carve. Even the shape of the fine horse beneath the human form was perfect too. Give him the head and neck of a full-blooded horse, and he would seem a steed for Castor, for his back was shaped so comfortable to be sat upon, and muscles swelled upon his arching chest. His lustrous body was as black as pitch, and yet his legs and flowing tail were white as snow. Many a female of his kind loved him, but only Halonomy gained his love. There was no other centaur made so beautiful as she within the woods. By coaxing ways she had won Solaris by loving and confessing love, by daintiness, so far as that was possible in one of such a form, she held as love, for now she smoothed her long locks with a comb, and now she decked herself with rosemary, and now with violets or with roses in her hair, and sometimes she wore lilies white as snow, 
and twice each day she bathed her lovely face in the sweet stream that falls down from the height of wooded Pegasa. And daily, twice she dipped her body in the stream. She wore upon her shoulders and left side a skin, greatly becoming of selected worth. Their love was equal, and together they would wander over mountainsides and rest together in cool caves. And so it was they went together to that palace cave known to the Lepithai. Together they fought fiercely in this battle, side by side. Thrown by an unknown hand, a javelin pierced Solaris, just below the fatal spot where the chest rises to the neck. His heart, though only slightly wounded, grew quite cold, and his whole body felt cold, afterwards as quickly as the weapon was drawn out. Then Halonomy held in her embrace the dying body, fondled the dread wound, and fixing her lips closely to the lips, endeavour to hold back his dying breath. But soon she saw that he indeed was dead. With mourning words which clamour over the fight prevented me from hearing, she threw herself on the spear that pierced her Solaris, and fell upon his breast, embracing him in death. Another sight still comes before my eyes, the centaur Pheocomes with his log. He wore six lion-skins well wrapped around his body, and with fixed connecting knots they covered him, both horse and man. He hurled a trunk two yokes of oxen scarce could move, and struck the hapless son of Olenus a crushing blow upon the head. The broad round dome was shattered, and his dying brains oozed out through the hollow nostrils, mouth and ears, as curdled milk seeps down through oaken twigs or other liquors, crushed out under weights, flow through a well-pierced sieve, and thick, squeeze out through numerous holes. As he began to spoil his victim, and your father can affirm the truth of this, I thrust my sword deep in the wretch's groin. Cothonius, too, and Tilliboas fell there by my sword. The former had a two-pronged stick as his sole weapon, and the other had a spear with which he wounded me. You see the scar, the old scar still is surely visible. Those were my days of youth and strength, and then I ought to have warred against the citadel of Pergama. I could have checked or even vanquished the arms of Hector, but alas, Hector had not been born, or was perhaps a boy. Old age has dulled my youthful strength. What use is it to speak of Periphas, who overcame Piratus double-formed? Why tell of Ampyx? who with pointless shaft victorious thrust Achiclus through the face. Macarius, hurling a heavy crowbar, pierced Erigdopus and laid him low. A hunting spear that Nessus strongly hurled was buried in the groin of Cymelus. Do not believe that Mopsus, son of Ampicus, was merely a prophet of events to come. He slew a daring two-formed monster there. Hodites tried in vain to speak before his death, but could not for his tongue was nailed against his chin, his chin against his throat. Five of the centaurs Caeneus put to death. Stiphilus, Bromus, and Antimachus, Elymus, and Perachmos with his axe. I have forgot their wounds, but noted well their names and number. Latreus, huge of limb, had killed and stripped Emathian Halesus. Now in his armour he came rushing out, in years he was between old age and youth but he retained the vigour of his youth, his temples showed his hair was mixed with grey. Conspicuous for his Macedonian lance and sword and shield, facing both sides, each way he insolently clashed his arms, and while he rode poured out these words in empty air, Shall I put up with one like you, O Caeneus? For you are still a woman in my sight. Have you forgot your birth, or that disgrace by which you won reward? At what a price you got the false resemblance to a man! Consider both your birth, and what you have submitted to. Take up a distaff and wool-basket, twist your threads with practised thumb, leave warfare to your men." While puffed-up pride was vaunting out such nonsense, Caeneus hurled a spear and pierced the stretched-out running side just where the man was joined upon the horse. The centaur, Latreus, raved with pain and struck with his great pike the face of Caeneus. His pike rebounded as the hail that slants up from the roof or as a pebble might rebound from hollow drum. Then, coming near, he tried to drive a sword into the hard side of Caeneus, but it could not make a wound. "'Aha!' he cried. "'This will not get you off. The good edge of my sword will take your life, although the point is blunt.' He turned the edge against the flank of Caeneus, and swung round the hero's loins with his long, curving arm. 
the flesh resounded like a marble block, the keen blade shattered on the unyielding skin. And after Caeneus had exposed his limbs unhurt to Latreus, who stood there amazed, Come now, he said, and let us try my steel against your body. And clear to the hilt, down through the monster's shoulder blade he plunged his deadly sword, and turning it again, deep in the centaur's entrails, made new wounds within his wound. Then, quite beside themselves, the double-natured monsters rushed against that single-handed youth with huge uproar, and thrust and hurled their weapons all at him. Their blunted weapons fell, and he remained unharmed and without even a mark. That strange sight left them speechless. "'Oh, what shame!' at length cried Monarchus. "'Our mighty host, a nation of us, are defeated and defied by one who hardly is a man. Although indeed he is a man, and we have proved by our weak actions, we are certainly what he was. Shame on us! Oh, what if we have twofold strength! Of what avail are huge and mighty limbs, doubly united in the strongest, hugest bodies in this world? And how can I believe that we were born of any goddess? It is surely vain to claim descent of great Ixion, who high-souled sought Juno for his mighty mate. Imagine it, while we are conquered by an enemy who is but half a man. Wake up, and let us heap tree-trunks and stones and mountains on him. Crush his stubborn life, let forests smother him to death. Their weight will be as deadly as a hundred wounds. While he was raving, by some chance he found a tree thrown down there by the boisterous wind. Example to the rest, he threw that tree against the powerful foe, and in short time Othrys was bare of trees, and Pelion had no shade. Buried under that mountainous forest heap, Caeneus heaved up against the weight of oaks upon his brawny shoulders piled. But as the load increased above his face and head, he could not draw breath. Gasping for life, he strove to lift his head into the air, and sometimes he convulsed the towering mass, as if great Ida, now before our eyes, should tremble with some heaving of the earth. What happened to him could not well be known. Some thought his body was borne down by weight into the vast expanse of Tartarus. The son of Ampicus did not agree, for from the middle of the pile we saw a bird with golden wings mount high in air. Before or since, I never saw the like. When Mopsus was aware of that bird's flight, it circled round the camp on rustling wings. With eyes and mind he followed it, and shouted aloud, Hail, glory of the Lepithian race, their greatest hero, now a bird unique. And we believed the verdict of the seer. Our grief increased resentment, and we bore it with disgust that one was overwhelmed by such a multitude. Then, in revenge, we plied our swords till half our foes were dead, and only flight and darkness saved the rest. Nestor had hardly told this marvellous tale of bitter strife betwixt the Lepithi and those half-human, vanquished centaurs, when Telepolemus, incensed because no word of praise was given to Hercules, replied in this way, Old sir, it is very strange you have neglected to say one good word in praise of Hercules. My father told me often that he overcame in battle those cloud-born centaurs. Nestor, very loath, replied, Why force me to recall old wrongs, to uncover sorrow buried by the years that made me hate your father? It is true his deeds were wonderful beyond belief, heaven knows, and fill the earth with well-earned praise which I should rather wish might be denied. Deophobus, the wise Polydamus, and even great Hector, get no praise from me. Your father, I recall, once overthrew Messenes' walls, and with no cause destroyed Elis and Pylos, and with fire and sword ruined my own loved home. I cannot name all whom he killed, but there were twelve of us, the sons of Neleus, and all warrior youths, and all those twelve but me alone he killed. Ten of them met the common fate of war, but sadder was the death of Periclaminus. Neptune, the founder of my family, had granted him a power to assume whatever shape he chose, and when he wished to lay that shape aside. When he in vain had been transformed to many other shapes, he turned into the form of that bird which is wont to carry in his crooked talons the forked lightnings, favourite bird of Jove. With wings and crooked bill and sharp-hooked talons he assailed and tore the face of Hercules. 
but when he soared away on eagle wings up to the clouds and hovered poised in air that hero aimed his too unerring bow and hit him where the new wing joined his side the wound was not large but his sinews cut failed to uphold him and denied his wings their strength and motion he fell down to earth his weakened pinions could not catch the air and the sharp arrow which had lightly pierced the wing was driven upward through the side into the left part of my brother's neck o noble leader of the rhodian fleet why should i sing the praise of hercules but for my brothers i take no revenge except withholding praise of his great deeds with you my friendship will remain secure when nestor with his honeyed tongue had told these tales of old they all took wine again and they arose and gave the night to sleep but neptune who commands the ocean waves lamented with a father's grief his son whose person he had changed into a bird the swan of phaethon and towards achilles grim victor in the fight his lasting hate made him pursue resentment far beyond the ordinary manner of the gods after nine years of war he spoke these words addressing long-haired smynthian apollo o nephew the most dear to me of all my brother's sons with me you built in vain the walls of troy you must be lost in grief when you look on those towers so soon to fall or do you not lament the multitude slain in defence of them to name but one does not the ghost of hector dragged around his pergama appear to you and yet the fierce achilles whose blood stained more than slaughtering war lives on this earth for the destruction of our toil let him once get into my power and i will make him feel the action of my triple spear but since i may not meet him face to face do you with sudden arrow give him death the delian god apollo gave assent both for his own hate and his uncle's rage veiled in a cloud he found the trojan host and there while bloody strife went on he saw the hero paris shoot at intervals his arrows at the nameless host of greeks revealing his divinity he said why spend your arrows on the common men if you would serve your people take good aim at great achilles and at last avenge your hapless brothers whom he gave to death he pointed out achilles laying low the trojan warriors with his mighty spear on him he turned the trojan's willing bow and guided with his hand the fatal shaft it was the first joy that old priam knew since hector's death so then achilles you who overcame the mighty were subdued by a coward who seduced a grecian wife ah if you could not die by manly hands your choice had been the axe now that great terror of the trojan race the glory and defence of the pelasgians achilles first in war lay on the pyre the god of fire first armed then burned his limbs and now he is but ashes and of him so great renowned and mighty but a pitiful handful of small dust insufficient for a little urn but all his glory lives enough to fill the world a great reward and in that glory is his real life in a true sense he will never know the void of tartarus but soon his very shield that men might know to whom it had belonged brings war and arms are taken for his arms neither diomed nor ajax call the less ventured to claim the hero's mighty shield menelaus and other warlike chiefs even agamemnon all withdrew their claims only the greater ajax and ulysses had such assurance that they dared contest for that great prize then agamemnon chose to avoid the odium of preferring one he bade the argolic chieftains take their seats within the camp and left to all of them the hearing and decision of the cause end of book 12 part 2